Tonight we're here to celebrate She's the Man, so please welcome back to Powell Theater stage our inaugural guests, Karen McCullough and Kirsten Smith. <laughs> I don't think we realized that we kicked off your whole. We were the first, yeah. Program. It was our first uh, first event uh, we ever did. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Well, that was that was very moving for us to see. I mean, we haven't seen it for for since it came out in the theater. I think, right? Yeah, yeah. I got a little teary at the end. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because our audience is roughly twenty years old today. Cool. Uh, they all grew up with it on TV, so it was, how was it actually sharing with an audience that never saw it in a movie theater before? I, I mean, it, it, felt, felt, <laughs> yeah, it felt very vibrant and exciting, and it, it, felt, it felt reminiscent of when we saw it in the yeah. theater the first time, actually. For me, I don't know, for you, too. Yeah, definitely. But you guys were a great audience, and thank you for coming, and, and that, it's a real, a real honor to be able to look at a movie that's, that was made at, um, a few years back and, and have you guys appreciating it. It's so. always more fun to watch a comedy with an audience, to hear what yeah. everybody else is laughing at and like share the experience. And plus, sometimes you guys laugh at stuff that like surprises us. Yeah. And we're like, wow, <laughs> they dug that? OK. <laughs> what surprised you? What, what, what I don't know, that? just like little things that, I don't know, just things that I've forgotten about that tickle me when everybody else laughs at. Um. Oogle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she is so, so brilliant. I know, Amanda? she's so good at Yeah, her. Amanda's just fantastic. And that Shannon guy's okay too. I mean, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's alright. Uh, <laughs> of course, he's awesome. I, uh, I, I've done, I've done it like 40 times, but I still have a hard time sometimes talking to women guests. So let me ask you my first question. Do you like cheese? <laughs> That came about <laughs> because we, one of our least favorite things to write is like romantic chit chat, like the meet cute stuff, which is kind of crazy because we end up doing it a lot. So we were just joking around with those lines and it made us laugh so hard because we thought it was just so silly that we're like, let's just put it in and see if it sticks. <laughs> and it made it all the way to screen. And so, yeah, so we, that's what makes us laugh the hardest when we see this. We're like, I can't believe the Gouda stuff is still in the screen. <laughs> Really held and then up. we doubled yeah. down by having it be the gift at the end. We're like, we're just right. going to milk this good stuff for <laughs> everything we can get out of it. Just to let you know, after the screening, we do have Gouda cheese in the reception. <laughs> really? We do. Oh. Cheese and crackers and some Gouda. Oh. Uh, my students insisted. Uh, Did you, do you have the big wheel? We don't have the okay, wheel. Okay, just the tiny pieces. That's it's fine. just yeah. the cheese, but not the, uh, we didn't want to go too crazy. And, uh, um, all right, so let's go back a little to the beginning. It's interesting because in the play, Viola, you know, the whole concept of Viola is like she couldn't reveal herself because for protection. Obviously, you have to update that modern. What was the choice to do it in contemporary times exploring this feminism thing in soccer? I think that was when we got hired to rewrite the script, it was set as Twelfth Night is in like a drama club. And we, right. I think the studios, like, we want to make it more. Something more like where feminism is an issue. So then we decided to go with sports. So I yeah. think that was the basis of it, was to take it a little bit further from Twelfth Night and make it more. Was there conversation about yeah. adding the sports element in terms of like get, getting a larger audience with boys? Yeah. And yeah. It's yeah like drama think, club was too much. I think of a we had a different sport in niche. mind. And they're like, no, soccer's really hot right now. We're like, and we're like right. oh, we got to learn yeah. all about soccer. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, okay, so Viola does a really great Amanda Bynes impersonation of hypermasculinity. How much <laughs> did you want to push the hypermasculinity angle in her portrayal in the script? Uh, I think I mean, she was actually doing an imitation of our director, Andy Fickman. Like, yes, that's, yeah, that's the was. voice she was doing. It was kind of a cross between him and Elvis a little bit, if you know. Yeah. <laughs> So. Well, yeah, Andy's from Texas, and so you notice sometimes she's got a little bit of a southern thing going on, or just a tiny hint of it. But yeah, you'll have to you'll have to watch some interviews with Andy Fickman if you really want to get the genesis of her <laughs> characterization. But she went to the Grove, and um, uh, didn't she do a lot of like practice walking around? Yeah, all the yeah. stuff where she's like following dudes on the street to get their strut down. Like she really did that. <laughs> no, that, yeah. that was part of the training. So what was it like working with Amanda? I mean, what did she kind of bring that kind of surprised you, perhaps, from your originally you envisioned the character? I, I was surprised that she could pass as a dude. <laughs> yeah. When I first saw her in the makeup, I was like, I guess she's going to pull this off. Yeah. yeah. 
That yeah. Surprising. And that they found a guy that looks just like her as a man. I was like, where'd he come from? Just a close enough. Like well, a, like yeah, a foot yeah. taller. <laughs> no one ever comments on that in the soccer field when he shows up. It's like, hey, he grew a lot right now. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, she, she was attached to the, the script when we got it. So we were kind of hired in a way by her along with her because um, we met with her to pitch her, her our ideas and, and kind of get her feedback on them and, and we to didn't tailor really, it to her. Yeah, and we didn't really know how she was gonna play the character because she didn't audition for the role. So it was it was really exciting. I mean it's kind of an electrifying br bravura bolt out there performance, I think. Oh, that's great. It's, uh, I actually did like the scene with uh, the captain, the hairdresser, teaching her how to be a man. It's actually yeah. one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, that her gay friend is teaching her how to be a man. It's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I think... Playing I think with a little gender enough. stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, I remember Amanda was... The, the script was called Dude Looks Like a Lady at one point. Oh, at one point, point. yeah. And um, God, I forgot Amanda... About that. And we were like pretty opposed to that title and, and Amanda had a lot of, I remember her being insistent that a title has to have that snappy thing. She's like, you've got you've to picture yourself saying, I'll take two tickets for whatever the title of the movie is. So she had a test of that and I thought that was always a good test of a title, like picture yourself saying, I'll take two for She's the Man, please. It's like, it works. Huh? All right, so uh, uh, Casey is one of my students. She's currently directing the show, and she wrote this next question. She did? Cool. Yeah, it's an important, it's the biggest question of the thing, and I have to get it perfectly right. How did you make it believable that goddamn Channing Tatum can't talk to girls? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Channing made that believable. Like, he's just, I mean, he's... He's so tender. And I know. <laughs> I've forgotten how like dreamy he is in this. Like, <laughs> he, was, yeah. he was also, as a side note, starving to death when we shot the film. He, he, yeah. he hadn't eaten food in maybe He was on the, the weeks. master cleanse because he, he was shooting yeah. a drama. It was lemon, Something pa about paprika, saints. and water. And, no, yeah. it was that cayenne honey lemon thing. Oh, clearly I've never done that. But wait, there was I a movie. Is <laughs> <laughs> that movie about like the hidden rooms of saints or something? I don't know. Yeah, Ain't, ain't the Body Saints, was that it? No. I don't Something think anyone saw it. It was like one of those indie movies that actors starve them for and four people see it. So it's like, <laughs> not, don't ever do that. If yeah, you're I don't think he ate any solid food during the filming. But Shannon, <laughs> can I, I was going to tell you this in the car, but I'm like, no, I'll save it. So during the <laughs> casting of this, we got to see the videos of auditions every day online, which is very unusual. Um, usually sometimes they'll send us tape afterwards, but every day we got to like be like, ooh, who do they have now? And so, as soon as I saw Channing, I'm like, that's, that's the one, clearly, like, that's, that's our guy. And he had just shot Step Up, but it hadn't come out yet, and he had done Coach Carter, so that was the only film on him, and in Coach Carter, he had a shaved head, so some of the powers that be involved in the movie thought that Channing looked too street to play boarding school, mm -hmm. and I was just like, make him grow his hair up, put on a tie, this is brain surgery, like, the, <laughs> this, what, what are you talking about? Like, he's the best one. He's hot, he's funny, and he can act. Like, the Lord doesn't always give with two hands. Like, it's usually one or the other. So, I was like, how does everyone not see this? And there was two other guys who've gone on to be successful that were the top two contention, was Milo Ventimiglia <gasps> and Jared Padalecki, who, <laughs> God bless them both, but they weren't Channing. Him, right? So <laughs> I was like, every day, I'm like, Channing's the one, Channing's the one. Like, I would email the producer, the director, the studio execs. I'm sure they hated my guts. But uh, finally, after like a month of interview or auditioning every other actor in town, the director called me and he was like, Karen, you're going to be very happy. We've just been an offer to Channing Tatum. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and I immediately called his agent. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm so happy. I have fought so hard for your client. This is going to be great. And five minutes later, I get a call. He's like, hi, this is Channing Tatum. I just want to say thank you so much. <laughs> it was the sweetest thing. So, and he still <laughs> always remembers us if he sees us out at premieres and parties. Like, I'm like, I can't yeah. believe you still remember me. And he's like, how would I forget? Like, you fought for me. I was like, he's a good dude. He's a good dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's very, he's very proud of this movie. Yeah. I know, he's so sweet. Yeah. Well, I mean, it did put him on the map. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, and it showed that he actually can do, because he was going to get typecasted pretty quickly. 
as just the dude or something like that. Sure, you can do comedy. Like he mm -hmm. actually had a lot of range. I know when he did 21 Jump Street, someone was like, oh, this is his first comedy. I'm like, no, it wasn't. No. <laughs> no. Go Wait back and watch, she's a man, he's funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so obviously, even 12th night or here, there's always a risk of getting caught, you know, the person hiding an identity. So what was the decision to be your first almost catching her with the tampons gag? Wait, what was our first what? The first time you wanted to get her almost caught with the tampons gag. Did you guys always land on that? That would be the no, first time she almost gets caught. Yeah, we always knew there was going to be a tampon joke. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think was there was there a version of that in Jack's original I script or I don't, I don't remember, but we definitely did the nosebleed. Yeah, which has gone on to become a worldwide phenomenon. I've gotten letters from people <laughs> who were like on ski trips in their brand new like baby blue jacket, and they got a nosebleed, and they were gonna bleed all over it. And then they remember they had a tampon, so they stuck it up their nose and <laughs> skied down the hill. Like someone sent that in letter form <laughs> too, <laughs> like typed up in a letter to me. I was like, yay. But it works. It works. Yeah. Saving the world. Yeah. One tampon at a One time. One tampon at a time. We're making the world a better place. But also, like, I mean, you had the, the sight gag with the, uh, you know, David Cross. You had, you know, the shower scene. You had a lot of great mm -hmm. sequences yeah. for that. How fun was kind of writing that and kind of developing that? Yeah, I feel like that was also Andy Fickman, the director, when he came on board. That was, a, that's a real gift of his. A lot of, um, a lot of those the set physical pieces. Humor. Yeah. yeah, the pizza, the Cesario scene with the boxes and, and he always wanted those missed opportunities, and he's great at physical comedy. There's, you know, there's a lot of falling and moving around physicality in the movie, which works very well. And I, I think. think David Cross came up with the idea that his character should be like washing windows in one scene, and like the cafeteria lady, and like clipping the <laughs> thing. He's like, he's like, I know I'm the headmaster, but I would just want to do like random <laughs> shit around the campus. Like, yeah. Okay. So was his, okay. so how much was like scripted for him and how much did you guys? I think uh, he probably re rewrote yeah. all of his lines. Yeah, <laughs> I, for sure. <laughs> I think so. But can't. the guy who plays Malcolm, the dude with the spider, he's like a huge Broadway star now. He's in a ton of stuff. I remember there was a lot of singing and dancing on set. Wasn't there a lot of boys doing a lot of know. songs and <laughs> harmonizing? It seemed very musical. Well, I think Channing made a couple movies about dancing, so that's yeah. probably, yeah, yeah I like yeah. it. <laughs> But it is really all about Channing and Amanda. I mean, the central relationship. So how did you want to use Duke to challenge uh, Viola's perception of what a man should be? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I feel like, I feel like it's a, the movie's about the ultimate partnership, right? I mean, that's, that is kind of the takeaway. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I felt moved by. Like, that's what we aspire to in relationship is like just being appreciated for our talents and having this romantic component and being able to teach each other is, it seemed like a dream relationship Well, just like, me. yeah, showing that a guy can be sensitive. And we yeah. had fun writing all the lines where he's just like, why do you always have to talk about women that way? Like yeah. just, <laughs> just kind of turning it on its head that way was fun. Yeah. Now, I thought that was an interesting twist, having the guys start calling her out. It's like, mm -hmm. dude, we don't behave, like, this is not, we don't do this. I mean, this is obviously a fantasy, but. Uh, <laughs> 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 we would like to think, maybe. <laughs> And especially the tarantula scene was great. I mean, having, you know, Channing showing the vulnerability. Yeah. Was that yeah. important for you to kind of show that he was kind of, he had the softer side? Because it also leads yeah. to the scene yeah, that he doesn't yeah. want to have sex. Like you yeah. want a relationship more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, all right, so we got to talk about the pizza scene. The breaking up with the three girls oh, yeah. in the pizza scene. <laughs> the show, what a dude he was. What was that? Was that all scripted? Was that really, or would you guys, how do you approach it that sequence? Yeah, scripted, but there was a lot of like stuff that, you just find on set, like people are walking by with pictures and the boxes mm -hmm. and like she can run behind the bar. Like a lot of that is directorial stuff. Yeah. It's hard to write physical comedy in a script because it's like. There's not a lot of payoff when you're reading it. Yeah. It's, yeah, she and A lot of people don't even <laughs> read the description anyway. It's like, <laughs> oh, there's a potted plant. I guess we know what's coming. Like, yeah, it's, it, it like, it's hard for me to write that. Like, I just like to be funny in dialogue. Kirsten sometimes will force me to be like, they said they want more physical comedy and I'm like, why can she trip over her? Okay. <laughs> and we have to act it out. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but Andy, our director on this, was like really big into physical comedy. So and Amanda too, like because she yeah. grew up doing that in her show. So, but it was interesting. But I, you know, I do like the fact that you guys did return to Twelfth Night because the whole thing about Duke sending, a, you know, Sebastian Viola to woo Olivia. How was that sequence, especially with writing the, in the chemistry lab, trying to build mm. their relationship in chemistry class? Mm. Oh, that was one of the yeah. few places that they could that wasn't on the soccer field or with the other guys around. But I thought that one of the most fun scenes is the carnival where she has to switch a million yeah. times and run into 
everybody. Like that was really yeah. fun to try to figure out all the moving pieces of that. Right. I've forgotten how many like fights are in this movie. Though. There's a lot of <laughs> like the bathroom girl fight. Yeah, like, that went on for like violent. ten minutes. I'm Quite like, violent. I'm yeah. like, they're like hitting each other's heads on the hinges of the door. <laughs> I'm like, someone would have died in real life. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can't just throw a hinge at someone. But yeah. I did see the Blu-ray actually with Amanda saying that was her favorite scene. Really? Well, really? To do the fight scene, she said she's had fun with the other actresses. Oh, yeah. that's good. Uh, <laughs> oh, we were like, ah. that girl that plays Monique is on This Is Us now. Alex Breckenridge. Oh. Yeah, she she's plays the hot guy as ex-wife. Uh, <laughs> I don't know his name, so. I will say, <laughs> the, but it'll talk Lila about. Lila No, not that one. The hot, the hot blondie one. Kevin. Kevin. I haven't seen <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> I do say dramatically, though, there was one moment that struck me, uh, the, the actress who played Olivia Laura Ramsey, the moment mm -hmm. when Sebastian tells her, I'm not interested in you, was actually one of the best things I've seen dramatically, her face. Yeah. The devastation in there. Is that something you wanted to make sure you had to get it grounded a little more in, rea in that point in reality? And yes. Pain? I mean, she, she's a very grounded, grounding force yeah. in the movie, it feels like. Mm -hmm. All these shenanig shenanigans are going on, and she's kind of she's holding it down. She's very sensitive, very very lovely human being, as I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, because so much of the movie is farcical that like, you have to have some emotional yeah. grounding points. And I don't know if you can answer this question, and, but we were talking about it with students, and I've been wondering this for years, so if you can answer it, awesome. How was Kissing Booth a thing? <laughs> That, <laughs> you know what's so funny? In like, 2006, it was a thing. It kind of grossed me out watching <laughs> yeah. it. Because I think, I remember we wrote the little kid and there was like the, you know, the person up top chanting. But the old man, I was like, oh, where? We didn't write dark. that, did we? I don't think, I hope we didn't. That, like, I, that was, must I have been like an extra on set who's like, can I just be in this right. seat? Like, yeah. I, I was like, a, I had a lot of shame I, uh, watching that. Yeah. It was but interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Kissing booths were a thing for a long time. Yeah, yeah. There's probably someone at, at one right now. We're, we don't know. <laughs> we not. <laughs> Is that part of the reception with the group? No, 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 no. We brought back kissing booths. No. <laughs> no. There's university rules. Yes, we, can, yeah. we can't do that. I know. That's yeah. definitely like, yeah, I can't uh, see that being. But actually, I mean, we, I mean well. obviously, it was a joke. But <laughs> the actual kissing scene was interesting because, like in the idea of Shakespeare, you can, she, the person can never reveal a true identity. It was great that she was the woman. She had to got the kiss him, but still couldn't tell him. Mm. That was actually mm -hmm. a good twist, you know, moment. Did you always have that in mind, where you had to have something yeah. where they would kiss or actually see each other as man and woman, but not be able to? Yes. Yeah, that was the funnest. The yeah. funnest. Listen to me. Yeah, that the was super the most fun funnest fun part. part. Yeah, yeah it was. It was <laughs> really. Well, it's kind of that Tootsie. You know, Tootsie was a, a reference point for us. I remember, and that that that's a big driving yeah. thing in in that film. I don't know if you guys have revisited that movie, but it's fantastic. And yeah, uh, students, just curious, how many have seen Tootsie? Oh, oh yeah, a lot of hands yeah, are yeah. going up. It's a classic. Uh, a great movie. And if I'm mistaken, Terry Gore won the screen, uh, actress, right? Supporting actress, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah really so. so I also did like your Rocky training scene. <laughs> Channing Tatum teaching her how to play soccer. The move. Yeah. <laughs> I think we just wrote, and then he teaches her how to play soccer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think we invented any of those I think moves. We, we did like, hey, he teaches a soccer her to do coach. the move. Right, like yeah. Like we had the move and we the had The fancy no kicking thing, what the, yeah. yeah. What that We didn't was. play soccer, if you can't tell, by, <laughs> by our description the of the game. But the montages were excellent. <laughs> yes, they were. Yes. <laughs> and they played off well, you see that you saw her develop. Yeah. And you saw him actually being kind of cool about, like he was, it was, I thought it was actually a really good romantic sequence for yeah. the, those two. Uh, also a nice trick of Malvolio, the villain in the play, making him a tarantula. Yeah. Were you guys yeah. scared writing a scene with spiders, or because I was creeped no. out when I read it? <laughs> when I, read the really? I think that came from like I was a little sister at a fraternity, and one of the guys had a tarantula, and it got out for like two days, and it was like somewhere in the fraternity house, and everyone was afraid. So I don't know even how we decided to turn Malvolio into a spider, but him getting was out was part of I don't know. It's weird where stuff comes from. It just comes out of your head. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, it did pay off with Channing and Amanda. It was a great moment. Yeah. The, uh, on the on the scene. Um, all right. So Eunice, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> was not originally a big character. She but yes. she apparently she grew when you guys, you know. I think the director just over. liked her so much that she kept getting into more <laughs> yeah. scenes and yes. bigger and bigger things. She. I mean, she I was. What happened to Eunice? We need to find out. She was always one of my favorite characters in writing the script. I remember like that we wanted her to get together with someone in the yeah. end, for sure. Um, yeah, she, what, 
Does that does Eunice play? I mean, what what is Eunice a she's fan kind of a stalker favorite now a little bit? She, yeah, yeah she's a little ex extreme, but yeah. We blessed. just kind of wanted her to be odd, but yeah, she she does come off as a little stalker with like the cupcake. And <laughs> 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 People um, like her. <laughs> but of course, Sebastian returns. Yep. And now all the ensues. So that actually, by the way, for the people who are thought, it follows the play. I mean, he returns mm -hmm. and all the things mixed up. How was that, did you, uh, that whole sequence of having them fall in love and bringing Sebastian back into the play? Well, luckily th we had a lot of like the plot already kind of laid out by Shakespeare. So it was yeah. a matter of just making this work in high school. But it was always like, yeah, getting them together. I mean, the whole thing with David Cross being like, and this is a girl. I don't know if that would fly right now <laughs> in high school. Yeah. Like <laughs> publicly outing someone that is trans, I guess would probably not really yeah. be too cool anymore. So, but at the time they're like, well, it all has to happen on the soccer field and the big reveal. And you know, it was just kind of like the formula of how it. Yeah, set pieces. Yeah, but yeah, watching that now, I was just like, that would, that would be frowned upon today, I think, <laughs> with his bullhorn. Probably. But, uh, but I, there was also some lines that they made us take out that they thought was too dirty. Um, when Sebastian pulls down his pants, uh, the boy Sebastian pulls down his pants, one of the other team members said, dude, I don't ever need to see your French bread again. <laughs> and they made us cut that. And I'm like, it's French bread. How is that? Let's like, it's not a, they're like, but we know you're talking about his penis. And I was like, well, yeah, that's kind of the point of the line. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't right, really know why. We had to do a lot of food dirty. euphemisms for genitalia. Oh yeah, we tried to, oh they wouldn't let us say balls. So then we changed it to kumquats, mm -hmm. which they also made us cut because they knew we were talking about balls. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of changing so, it to food if that you can't That year Kirsten bought me a kumquat tree that is still in my yard. <laughs> <laughs> that was my Christmas present. And she brought it in, she's like, do you know what this is? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and and she's I like, said, it's, it's balls. <laughs> and I was like, a kumquat tree. <laughs> yeah. That's why I had to come quadri because they wouldn't <laughs> let us say balls. The no, but actually the soccer thing was great. It was a great metaphor, and you know, in the British coach, like you had some really interesting kind of playing stereotypes. Is that something you guys like doing, just like messing with stereotypes in your writing? Yeah, I, I, I guess I guess we do. I mean, the coach, we we did write it for Peter Dinklage, which is why his name is Coach Dinklage in oh, the movie. But, but that this was is before Game of Thrones. This is see, we're star know. makers. We knew. We knew. We knew. <laughs> We, we tried to write him into many, many screenplays. Um, he doesn't know that we're he just sitting know there that we're like <laughs> character secretly writing character parts for him. But, but they, they, they were like, no, that seems like an We're going to hire Vinnie Jones yeah. instead, yeah. who did a fine job. Yeah. He's no Peter Dinklage, but he did a fine job. <laughs> <laughs> so what was, who was more fun to write, Malcolm or Justin, or two villains of the movie? Oh. Probably Mal Malcolm a little more than Justin. Malcolm because he's more the unusual villain. Yeah. Like he's like the you know the kind of nerdy villain, whereas Justin's just like your basic douchey boyfriend. <laughs> but it was yeah. fun to to write. He's um, actually very nice in real life. Viola's retorts to him. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was also yeah the great fight scene with Channing and you know. And Another Justin. fight scene. I know. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of so bloodshed and she's the man. Who knew? Now, this is not your, that was not your first for, foray into Shakespeare. No, it Ten wasn't. Ten Things Hate About You. Yes, mm -hmm. that was our first uh, foray and um, our second screenplay that we, that we wrote together. And, and um, yeah, we, we kind of came up with that after searching for uh, far and wide for a classic to adapt and um, we landed on on Taming of the Shrew and wrote it as a spec screenplay, meaning we took it up on ourselves to, to write it to write it all out and hope that we would find a home for it. And, and we were lucky enough to have that happen and that kind of started our career. Now, of course, did you know at the time, uh, Heath Ledger, when he does his I Can't Take My Eyes Off You song, uh, did you know um, how he conquered scene would become? How what? How iconic that scene would become. I mean, it's most played on YouTube. It's oh. the Heath Ledger singing to Julia. Well, I think we hoped. I, I, we, I we actually had a different song in there, and they changed it on the set to make it a more romantic song. We had kind of a more funny, dirty song in mind, but everyone's like, that's <laughs> not romantic, but I'm like, but it's funny. <laughs> but, uh, I touch I'm, I'm myself. Yeah, right? by the Divinals. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? It's funny. It would have been a but, different uh, experience. It wasn't quite as romantic <laughs> as the one that Heath chose. So. 
glad he stepped in there and saved us from ourselves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned Star Maker, and I mentioned last time you are the pen that launched a thousand careers. What is it? What do you think, honestly? Why, you know, Reese Witherspoon, breakout role, Legally Blonde. Heath Ledger, breakout role in America here. Channing Tatum, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. What do you What do you think is why you get Why do you think your roles are attracting this ta amazing talent who are just starting in their career? I, I, that is a hard thing to be able to it's pinpoint. Um, <laughs> I mean, I we know. we were we were just like really writing from I think the we're heart lucky. at that yeah. point, and it was a yeah, just sort of a timing, a coalescing of of all of these people coming of age at the moment that we were coming of age as writers and. Um, yeah, we're, we were we just blessed. Yeah, we just got really lucky that the people that ended up in our movies ended up, you know, becoming icons. Did you uh, <laughs> did you see the talent of Heath Ledger before uh, when you first met yes, him? Yes, absolutely. Like, did you know that this was going to happen for him? Yeah, I mean, he's he uh, we we met him before he was cast in the movie, and he actually moved moved into an apartment down the street from me with a friend of mine. So. Uh, he just arrived from Australia, and he, he's, he was just immediately one of those electric people where you just, you just feel that jolt of, you're kind of nervous around him. He had, he had such a, just a big, big presence. I wasn't nervous around him, but I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm more like, he was Eunice, a little Eunice <laughs> ask <around. laughs> So you asked him if you like cheese and got nervous with <laughs> yeah. the Gouda. Uh, yeah, that's how we got it. But, and theoretically, I mean, obviously he was a huge star in Julia. How much was their chemistry together? Like, because that could have not worked if they, you had the wrong yeah. actress against, you know. Yes, and they, they did um, screen tests with different combinations to see how the chemistry worked, and theirs was just perfect. I remember in the screen test, she was, she was blushing. She was nervous. Which is, yeah. 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 And by the and end of the shoot, she was dating Joseph Gordon-Levitt in real life. So then it got kind of awkward whenever she had to kiss Heath, because it's like... There's my boyfriend watching from the side. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's go back to your first. All right, so how did you guys initially connect? Like, what was? How did you first meet and start your partnership? Well, we met. Um, we met at how many years ago now? I mean, over 20 years ago. And and um, Karen was writing screenplays. She was living in Denver, and I was living in LA, uh, working for a company reading scripts as as my job there. And I would read letters from people saying, hey, you want to read a script? Um, here's the concept of it. Here's the idea. And, and I read some of a, a script by Karen, and I, I loved it. And I called her on the phone or, and asked her to read another script. And then we, um, we decided that when she would come to LA for meetings, we would meet. And we met for margaritas when she came to LA. And, and one margarita turned into maybe, I don't know, 18 or 19 margaritas. And <laughs> the next thing you know, we're, we're writing a script on cocktail napkins, making notes and our partnership. We kind of got like pregnant on the first date, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that script was never made, oddly enough. A script started on cocktail napkins after 18 margaritas. I mean, it just sounds like a recipe for success, right? <laughs> Well, it's interesting you mentioned script, script reading, because I used to do it, and my brother actually introduced it to me. And just for your screenwriters to know, most scripts are terrible. <laughs> and when you read scripts, no, it's like, well, especially when you're looking to purchase scripts. Yeah. So uh, do you have that same experience where that's why Karen's script stood out so much to you? Because you read so many bad ones? Yes, so many bad ones. And I, I was just loved her writing voice and um, felt, and then when we met in person, it felt like there was a simpatico about um, just writing funny, strong female characters, um, not not out of any agenda. Just that's those were the movies that we wanted to see and mm -hmm. the stories we wanted to tell. And then how did we how did we get to Legally Blonde? That was based on an unpublished manuscript at the time, and they sent it to us, and we said, uh, "Yes, we would like to turn this into a movie." And, and that was we right. Did. We we received it right when Ten Things came out in the movie theaters. So. Um, yeah, it was a it was our our big follow up to that, and and um, did we have to go and do a little pitch meeting to get to I meet MGM, and we wore yeah. a little pink in the meeting <laughs> to sort of show <laughs> our pink our pink spirit. Mm. <laughs> it worked. 
Was Reese already attached or was no. she circling it? No, she wasn't. She she read. She became involved after reading the script. And now, I mean, now it's interesting because now she's in writing, producing, helping other women. You know, oh, her production right. company. Incredible. Did, yeah. Is that something you'd sense in her that she wanted to do other things, like just yeah. act and lead yeah. the way? She was she was really producerial, and um, you know, we she had great notes on our on our script and gave her ideas and. Uh, and they were they were really good and and it's clear she's just you know she's a a strong creative really bright woman who was not just driven in in the best possible way so I mean what the work she's doing now is oh, so cool um, so so let's let's uh, the question we're going to open up the audience soon so get your questions ready but I want to ask how does a writing team work who does what how do you write together. We used to do it in separate rooms and then put the script together, but then we were just ended up rewriting each other's scenes, so then we just decided to just do it in the same place and write yeah. it together at and the same time. And it led to too More many. Fun. You know, this, this script might have been one of the first times where we really, we decided to do all the writing in the same room, right? Because we were writing, yeah. we were re, you know, it was a, it, there was a pre-existing script that we kind of worked off of. Um, so yeah, we, we realized we want to be we want to be in collaboration together instead of like picking each other's things apart, work apart. And I guess you can also brainstorm a scene together when you're yeah. you know you have different yeah. opinions and how to push. Because it's it. like, what if we do this? Then it's like, oh yeah, what if we do that? Like it just snowballs. And has it has you, has your process evolved since then, or is it kind of still? Yeah, it's still. I mean, sometimes we go back on a recent projects. We did start writing separate scenes and putting them together, and we found that we were like less feisty about, about rewriting each other than we used to be. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, we used to always say, like, whoever argued the longest at a point, <laughs> or, like, cared the most would win. <laughs> but now we're like, I don't care. If it doesn't work, we'll just do something else. Like, <laughs> just, life's too short to argue about this life. <laughs> so, yeah, we've just gotten a little easier. And where is your favorite locale to write? together. Probably cool. by Karen's pool. <laughs> yeah, we do a lot of good thinking by that particular body of water. <laughs> <laughs> We're in it. <laughs> All right, so we do have time for a few questions from the audience before we have our Gouda. Hi. Um, the whole movie has such a great like early 2000s, 2000s feel to it. And um, I was wondering if your writing style has changed or stayed true to that? Uh, I don't know. I like to think I we change with the times. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, it would be cool for you to read one of our recent screenplays and tell us if it feels two thousands or two thousand eighteen. I don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is. It is funny watching this movie though, because it. I mean, it does feel like whoa, it's a time capsule taking me back. <laughs> um, but I, I how much good music's in this movie. I too. mean, we we yeah. hang out. We hang out with a lot of people in different different age groups and um, so I I like to think we we have a, we still have a, a fresh a fresh taste in our mouths of <laughs> something this is not a metaphor going well but <laughs> my question is kind of related but um, I was wondering because like thoughts on sexuality and gender has, have changed so much. Um, yeah. How is it for you, like, watching how these topics are dealt with in this movie, looking back? Well, that's what I was saying, the, the kind of the outing on the football field with the bullhorn now is just, that would never happen. I mean, it, in, and rightfully so, it's pretty obnoxious, <laughs> but. <laughs> then there's moments, though, where it feels like, oh, right, we're this, like, there's this subtle thing of, like, gender's fluid and you find love, it doesn't matter which gender you are if you're connecting with someone, but. Well, how did you, how did you feel watching it? Like, I am curious to know where, what, what the feeling is when you watched it. Um, like me personally? Yeah. Oh, um, well, we were talking about it before. We were like, does that mean Channing Tatum's character, like, is his sexuality kinda, fluid? Because yeah. like, the whole time he's kind of felt love like with that too. Him, the, or him, See, we're cutting edge. Probably. We're not two thousand eight. A question right over there. That's cool. <laughs> and it kind of felt like that with the Laura Ramsey character too, right? Yeah. 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 Hi. Uh, hi. So I 
love this movie. I grew up watching it, and it's definitely one of the few um, English-speaking movies that my mom also loves as well. <laughs> awesome. So um, you all were talking about loving really strong female characters, and that incorporates into your own writing. Is there any other aspect of storytelling that really inspires you, and has there been any movies recently that's really inspired your writing? I really loved Lady Bird this year. I thought it was great, and that it was weird to me that that had that had not. There's not been a lot of female coming of age movies like that, and it, it's just I'm I'm excited for there to be a lot of copycat Lady Birds, so we can have more movies about teenage girls. Because for a long time, there's a there was a sort of decade um, in the 2000. 9, 2010, 11, 12, early teen era where movies about teenage girls aren't, weren't being made at studios anymore. They just kind of stopped. So um, I, I'd like to see more movies about teenage Well, Edge of 17 was one that like, yeah. no one really saw that I really liked. Um, yeah, it's a great movie. Fun. But I think we've, we've always both been attracted to writing characters that are like girls that just do what they want to do and don't let anyone tell them they can't. So that I like. I always like movies with characters like, "Ooh, we got snaps on that!" <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. With a kind of underdog element too, like, yeah, the message of "Don't let anyone else define you" has been a resonant one for yeah. us. Hi. Um, another character that I think really reflects that is uh, Viola's mom. Um, mm -hmm. So I right. just kind of wanted to ask, what? brought her about and did you guys uh, write her dialogues? I think there's some really great scenes with her and the, all the other characters. Yeah, we just wanted her to be kind of the polar opposite of Viola to show their conflict. And I didn't even know about the whole Debbie Tom Ball thing until I got to college, because they didn't do it in the town where I went to high school. Then I went to college in Virginia and everyone had a picture of themselves in a big white dress and I'm like, are y'all married? Like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is so weird. So I've always kind of been fascinated by it. It's like such an archaic thing, but it's traditional and like people want to do it. So more power to them, they should. But Viola clearly didn't want to do it. So I like that battle of her and her mom. Yeah, that she was kind of, the mom is pushing this like hyper femininity on Viola and she's not having it. But then at the end she rocked her own dress, not a big white floofy one. She kind of did it her own way. So she gave mom a win, but she didn't have to like, wear the big white dress. Maybe that's why you and your mom like watching it together. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, so I love the movie, obviously, why I'm here. But um, I also love Twelfth Night. Um, and the character Malvolio is a big part of that. And I know he was obviously shown as the tarantula, but I was wondering if uh, the character Malcolm was inspired at all uh, by the character Malvolio. I imagine he was, but I can't remember. That's my <laughs> honest answer. Yes. It's <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> Kirsten says yes. <laughs> and our final question. Uh, anything? I know, I yep. feel a little bad that we're, you, there's so many amazing Shakespeare scholars here. Like, we can learn from you guys. I feel, yeah. I feel like we gotta brush up a bit. <laughs> Let's do it. Is there a class that we can take Of here? course, <laughs> of course. Okay, good. <laughs> May we audit. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Hi, so the bulk of your work that we've been discussing, if not all of it, has um, been consisting of movies. And so with today's streaming services and how binge watching has become um, such a popular activity to do, do you ever find yourself wanting to dabble or transition to writing for television or like episodes? Eventually everything yeah. will be streaming is what we're being told every day. Yeah, we I'm keep, I fight that. I'm a traditionalist, I want everything on the big screen. Which is why it's been so great to watch this with you guys on the big screen. So, uh, all everyone here is the first time seeing it on the big screen? Yeah. Wow. Every, no. One person. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, yes, we do you think saw, about yeah. dabbling in TV, because it's, yeah, we're, it's just part of the business now. You, you can't really choose one over the other. We've been slow. More TV is getting made. We've been kind of dragged kicking and screaming into that <laughs> new frontier, so. You can't write TV from your pool. That's my biggest objection. <laughs> you have to go into you like to, an you have office to put, like, area. Clothes and shoes and a bra on and it and <laughs> drive in a car to go then, somewhere to do it. And they want you to be there at <laughs> 10 yeah. or even 9.30. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. It's brutal, you guys. <laughs> 
I don't know if you've heard about that, but we're here to tell you the truth. We're never going to get jobs. <laughs> <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> On the other hand, as writers, you can explore characters in a different yes. way. So yeah. that's the trade-off. Yes. Uh, okay, so, so we'll we be back here when we t when we have our TV show. We'll be back to talk about it. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so we end our show with the same question. Okay. Uh, uh, so can you tell us about a movie theater experience you had as a child or a movie that inspired you going to the theater? Um, for me, it was seeing one of them. I remember seeing Flashdance when I was 12. I was visiting my, my aunt in Honolulu, and I went alone to the theater, um, and I was like, left the theater and fully <laughs> dancing down the street, uh, feeling so empowered and so excited and so good about my, my moves and everything. And I, I, I fell <laughs> in, the, in, the, in, the, in the road and guys drove by in a Jeep and they were like, cuts like a knife. Which is like weirdly a song of that era. I don't know. And I hoisted myself up and trudged on. But oh I, I still love the movie and I thank it for making me feel like dancing. Yes. What about you, Karen? <laughs> um, I think Grease was the movie I loved the most as a kid. Did you, I, where'd you see that? I saw it in a theater in Japan because oh. my, my dad worked in Japan, so I saw it on the Navy base with my parents, and I just, I think I've seen it probably 300 times since then. No. Oh, great. Is that an actual number? Oh yeah, 100? I can recite the whole movie for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> like the parents. Yeah, I was madly in love with Danny Zuko. Um, he's the only celebrity I've ever met where I was like literally speechless, like, because I've seen the movie so many times. So when he was like, hi, nice to meet you, all I could say was, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish one of my friends had recorded that. Because Did he respond? Funny. He just smiled and said, that's nice. He's <laughs> <laughs> very sweet. But like, as you get older and you watch that movie again and again, you're like, wait, is the message we're being told that you have to dress like a slut to get your man? Yeah. <laughs> that's not a very good message. It's problematic. Yeah. That, that yeah. scene could use a rewrite. But of course, <laughs> how many times have we all dressed up as Sandy in her black outfit for Halloween? Right? right? We still do it. <laughs> it's, it's a very satisfying scene, but then when you think about the message afterwards, you're like, not so much. Does that movie, do you, is that a movie that's important to, to you guys? Oh, yeah. it's great, right? Yeah, just as a point of reference, when we first came out, it was out in the theater for nine months, and it would be the only local theater would play that movie for almost a year. So it was oh, really, yeah. you would wow. see it over and over and over again. Wow. Pre-multiplex, so. Uh, well, I mean, you are the first guest to come back a third time. Oh, we didn't oh first yeah. Yeah. Uh, we do want to, we do want to thank you for watching our series. Thank you. Uh, and inspiring our next generation of screenwriters, our students. Yeah. yeah. And we look forward to the TV premiere, movie premiere, whatever you got next. Cool. We want you back. Oh, right, thank thanks. you. Thank you so much, Matt. <laughs> oh, thank you, Carlos.